Hello, friends. Glad to have you with me today, and I thank you for listening in. I'm going to try to keep this short, but I'm telling you, I've got a lot I want to say today from this text, so please bear with me. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 10 through chapter 16 and verse 13, but before we go to this new material, I must back up and say something that I intended to say in episode number 15 in our study of Jeremiah, and that is the mention of Manasseh in chapter 15 and verse 4. There, Jeremiah refers to the responsibility of Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, for at least some of Judah's apostasy. Now think about that. Here was one person, a king, who had a profound influence upon an entire nation, and it was not a positive one. You might refer to 2 Kings chapters 21 through 24 to learn more about his wickedness. Manasseh misled the people to do more evil than the nations had done that the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. That's 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 9. He was a bad, bad dude. God was going to bring death and destruction upon his people because of this one king, which of course reminds us of the powerful influence that one person, just one person, can have upon the people around him. In fact, it reminds me of a prayer that was posted by someone in our Praying Jeremiah online community based upon this very text. And Chad Lucason posted this prayer. It's excellent. Let me read it for you. As I read this text, I see the difference that one person can make. Because of Manasseh, Judah eventually receives destruction, death, and captivity. The decisions of one person can lead to long-term consequences for generations. So true, Chad. Help my faithfulness to you. Reap long-term benefits for generations to come, he writes. Make my life a domino that sets off a reaction of praise and glory for you for generations to come. Isn't that outstanding? The powerful influence that one person can have upon the people around him or her. That's something. Okay, let's go into our text for the day now. Here are some of Jeremiah's confessions and God's reply to him. We read in verse 10 that Jeremiah shows his self-pity, and God's reply urges Jeremiah to discard his self-pity and to press on with his task. Again, Jeremiah cries out that he has been faithful in the discharge of his task, despite the loneliness and the hatred that were his lot, He's asking God in these verses to take note of him. <laughs> in verse 16, Jeremiah says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And perhaps that's a reference to the finding of the book of the law in the temple during Josiah's reign. In essence, Jeremiah is saying, I accepted your call to speak your word. In verse 17, Jeremiah's special role had separated him from the normal social relations enjoyed by others. He was isolated by the grim task that was his to perform. The reason he sat alone, it was because of the Lord's hand, Jeremiah admits. And then verse 18, note how Jeremiah expresses the feeling of abandonment. He feels like God has deserted him. He says, I came to this creek bed looking for water and it turned out to be a dry wadi. Boy, he's accusing God of something strong there, isn't he? And when I read these words, his confession, I can't believe he's so open with God and so honest with God. Uh, there's boldness in his words. And perhaps it's a boldness which is only found in those who have a very close personal relationship with God. Would you agree with me there? I don't know. Anyway, here is God's reply to Jeremiah's words. God calls upon Jeremiah himself to repent in verse 19. These are such powerful words. Do you mind if I read them to you? Let's see. I'm in chapter 15, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord, If you turn back, I will take you back, and you shall stand before me. 
If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall serve as my mouth. It is they who will turn to you, not you who will turn to them, and I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you, for I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. Boy, these are fantastic passages. Jeremiah, you yourself need to repent of such talk as may be found in verses 15 through 18. Then when you turn back and repent, you will stand before me. In other words, I will restore you to your prophetic office. If you utter what is precious, not what is worthless, you shall serve as my mouth. And it's as if God is saying to Jeremiah, when you do that, the people will turn to you, not you to them. In other words, the people are dependent on Jeremiah to hear God's word. But Jeremiah, well, he has no need to listen to anything that the people say to him. Perhaps God was telling Jeremiah that he had been overly concerned with what people thought or said about him when his one concern should have been to heed God's word and to proclaim it. I will make you a fortified wall of bronze. Now that recalls chapter 1, verse 18, and Jeremiah's call. It's as if God is saying, Jeremiah, I want you to remember what I told you when you started this mission. I told you I'm going to make you a strong wall. People will not be able to prevail against you. You just continue to speak my message and all will be well. Well, finally, I want to say a word about chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, and then application. This section tells how Jeremiah was forbidden to marry and to enjoy the normal joys and sorrows of his people. These deprivations made his life a picture of the fate that awaited the nation. So Jeremiah is acting out and living out what will happen to the entire nation of Israel. And notice verse 12 of chapter 16, God says, All of this suffering and destruction can be traced back to one thing, your stubborn, evil heart that refuses to listen to and obey me. Mm. Now, I want to say a word about application here. And this application is for everyone who speaks for God, preachers, teachers, church leaders, missionaries. Here is the way I think we could apply this passage. People need to hear the word of the Lord. It may not always be warmly received. It may not always be welcomed. But this is what people need, right? They need to hear the word of the Lord. And our task is to proclaim it. So, however we have suffered, we must get off of our pity pots and get after the task that the good Lord has given us. And that is to proclaim the Lord's word. On the other hand, if we are the ones who are listening to someone who is proclaiming the word of the Lord, here is the application for us. Preacher, teacher, missionary, give me a thus says the Lord. Give me the word of the Lord. That's what I need. I can't promise that it won't anger me when I hear what you have to say, but I'll try not to be angry with you my anger will be directed to God, perhaps, but I know that I need to hear the word of the Lord. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's talk briefly about a preview of chapter 16, verse 14 through 17, verse 8. Jeremiah speaks of a new exodus in chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, followed by yet another word of judgment. You know, those words of judgment seem to never come to an end, right? In chapter 16, verses 19 through 21, we read about the conversion of the nations. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 4, Judah's guilt. And our reading will close with chapter 17, verses 5 through 8, where we are, where, where we are reminded again of the value of trusting God. I'm telling you, these passages are so rich with meaning. They are just so good, aren't they? 
I hope you're enjoying this study of Jeremiah as much as I am, and I'm sure you are. And I'll see you again, Lord willing, in a few days. God bless.